Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's co -ho creator, host, chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide for the next hour. But first, let me just introduce this week's program and describe where the forum comes from before we get to our guest. So to begin with, the forum was started in 2016, and the idea is to provide a space for people to have conversations about the future of higher education. So this isn't based on presentations. The slides we have here are just for a quick intro. The idea instead is to have conversation, to have discussion among people as we collaboratively explore where higher education might be headed. And one of the great things about that exploration is that we do this with a wide range of people. We have people from multiple countries, from multiple professions, different types of institutions, all kinds of background. We have college presidents, government officials, professors. Uh, we have scientists. We have humanists. We have students. We have librarians and technologists. We have a really wide range of people. I and mean, one of the great things of the forum is our ability to network and connect across all of those folks. Now, looking ahead a little bit uh, to the next month or so, uh, we have a whole bunch of different programs. In fact, I am right now scheduling into July, uh, and I'm going to put up a new blog post about all those sessions. But for the next few weeks, we have a great session on supporting equity in higher education, another one on e-learning from one of the great scholars and leaders in the field, another one on reinventing a public university where our guest is a president of an extraordinary university, and next week, we have our fifth year anniversary program. So this is gonna be very silly and playful. I'm gonna be giving out t-shirts and free books. We're gonna have contests and games. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your reflections, and where you'd like to see us take the form over the next five years. If you'd like to uh, learn more about those different programs or sign up, just go to tinyurl.com slash forum 2021. Now, let me just quickly thank some of our supporters before we go further. I'd like to begin by thanking NYSERNet in New York State. That's a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities get online with great broadband and do excellent collaborative work together. We're very excited by their professional development and very honored by their support. We're also grateful to Shindig because, as you can see, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So if you haven't been here for a while or if the Shindig technology is new to you, let me just quickly show you how to make it work for you. First of all, where I am right now and where our guest is going to be in just a minute is called the stage. Now, it was called that because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on stage. In fact, we can have up to six people up here at one time if you're uh, Shindig uh, Habitue, yes, that is new, is expanded to allow more. Uh, now below us, if you look around the bottom half of the screen, you should see a bunch of different people. I'm looking around and I'm seeing uh, Kate Borowski, I'm seeing Sarah Shun, um, I'm seeing uh, Marcus, uh, I think it's Longnitz. Uh, that's roughly 20 or so people who have logged in around the same time with you. And that's your chunk of the audience. And these are all people that you can chat with if you like. So just mouse over them. And if they want to have a private conversation with you, click on them. Your two icons will snap together like Legos. You can have your own private audiovisual bubble. And I think of it as like being at a show or being in a lecture and leaning over to somebody and whispering to them. Now, I said this is all about conversation. How do you do that? Look in the bottom of the screen. You'll see running along in a white strip with a few different buttons. The key two buttons I want you to see are question mark and raised hand button. Now, if you press the question mark, up pops a little box where you can type in your question or comment. And when the time is right, I flash that on the screen for everyone to see, and I read it out loud so everyone can hear it. So that's a great way to get across your thought or question for our guest. Now, next to that, you'll see a raised hand button. And if you press that, that tells me that you want to join us up here on stage. So if your camera is on and your audio is on and you'd like to be up here for face-to-face -face conversation, just press that button. And when the time is right, I'll press another button and you'll be right up here alongside our guest. So those are the two main ways that people can share their thoughts and participate. Um, now, if you'd like to also just chat informally with folks, back on that white strip on the leftmost edge, you'll see a number and a button. If you press that, That'll give you a chat box that lets you chat with uh, mostly the people who are nearest to you in the audience. And that's often a way for people to chat informally, to say hello to each other, to share jokes, try out ideas, sometimes to share uh, links that came up during our discussion. But that's another way. And also, if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE, 
uh, I'll be checking that throughout the program. And uh, people can uh, uh, often tweet out from inside the event, and we'll see people tweeting into it uh, for those who can't quite make it. So those are the main ways to participate. Uh, please uh, join us during the rest of the hour because the rest of the hour is entirely yours. And we're really grateful to Shindig for making available this technology. And we're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. If you don't know Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site which lets you collaboratively fund an ongoing project. In this case, it's our project of exploring the future of higher education. So some folks contribute as little as a dollar a month, which is great, just to help keep the lights on. Some contribute $10 or more a month. We've got a wall of their credits right here, right now, so you can see all those fine people. We're really grateful to them for their support. And you can join them. You just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. All right. Now, all of that, all of that uh, is an introduction so that you can get a sense of where the program is, uh, what it's about, uh, what we hope to accomplish. Now, what I'd really like to do is welcome our guest. Shannon Dunn is at the University of Florida, uh, where she is the assistant director for the UF's information technology department. Uh, among other things, she just won a great award from Educause, an award for being uh, a rising star in education and technology. And I just want to read this to you so you can get a sense of just how awesome she is. Uh, she was awarded specifically for contributing to advances in instructional technology, for advocating for excellence of teaching and learning, for promoting student success, for championing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and for being a supportive mentor and insightful leader. Uh, Shannon, I'm absolutely delighted you could make it. Thank you for being here. Absolutely, thank you for the invitation, Brian. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure, it's our pleasure. Listen, we, we have a tradition here in the forum when we ask people to introduce themselves in a particular way. We ask you not to talk about the past, but about the next year. So what do you, what looks large, what looms largest for you for the next year? What's gonna take up most of your time and also most of your thought? <laughs> so I will speak hopefully. Uh, I hope that what takes up most of my time is helping my staff debrief from and understand what we can take forward from the past year and also think about how we can make our services more inclusive. Mm. So I manage instructional design and educational technology services in a central unit, which is situated within IT. Mm -hmm. And before the pandemic, we were always busy. We didn't really change our services because we had a lot of folks coming to us. During the pandemic, we realized that we really weren't reaching as many people as we wanted to. And in particular, we weren't reaching people who maybe were earlier career, were um, members of different marginalized communities or groups. And so we really want to figure out how we can be more supportive intentionally of different folks across the next year. Pretty quickly share this out on Twitter because I think that's admirable and that tells us a lot about your strategy and, and, and your thinking. Um, friends, I have all kinds of questions uh, for, uh, for Shannon, but the key thing here in the future transform is for you to share your questions and your thoughts. So again, just reach down to the bottom of the screen and either click the raised hand if you want to join us. You can tell that Shannon is friendly, not just because she's nice, but also because she has a great painting of a dog behind her, so you know she's going to be nice. <laughs> Or if you'd rather just type in a question, just go to that question mark and, and type it in there. And, and before I could say anything more, I mean, already a hand has come up from the awesome Maria Anderson, longtime friend of the program, guest, and uh, just a great person to know. So let's bring her up on stage. Hello. 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 Hold on. I don't know why my camera isn't showing up. One second. Okay. I'm getting it up for you. There you go. There we go. So I'm curious what you think faculty are going to do once the pandemic is over, they're back to their face-to-face -face classrooms. What are they going to do differently? What do you think they're going to do differently? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, one of the things that we noticed, and I kind of hinted at this a little bit, um, we, we encountered a lot of faculty who didn't have as much technology confidence or knowledge as we anticipated. So I think I think there's different groups, right? There are different folks in the the scale of, of adoption for technologies. 
Um, I think that people who were formerly technology shy or technology averse are obviously in a different position than folks who were already maybe teaching online or doing some innovative things in their classroom. I suspect that in the next year, faculty are going to finish their breath. I could be wrong. But I, I wonder if folks are going to need some time to kind of rely on what they've done rather than really being geared up about what they might want to do. Um, that's, that's my suspicion. Um, that said, some of those folks who were more innovative as a, revolt, as, as a result of the pandemic were more excited, they pushed themselves, they found out that maybe trying something and failing wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and trying something and failing with students actually models something really great for them. I think that those folks might be really excited to continue to try to do different things. Um, so again, those are the folks that I'm anticipating our unit is going to hear from more. Um, the folks who, again, already were doing really innovative stuff, they often know what they're doing. Uh, and while we like to help them, that's often very exciting for us. They don't, they don't need us as much. Um, so I think and then, and then there's gonna be folks who go back into the classroom and are gonna be happy to return to their paper syllabus and their stamp <laughs> ones. Those folks are still there and we still need to support them too, right? I mean, everybody's in their different, their different place. So we very much try to support people where they are. And if they're not really interested in changing and growing, that's okay. Are they still delivering the educational outcomes and experiences that their students might benefit from? So. I don't know. I, that's not a very specific answer, Maria. I'm sorry, but I um, I wonder if part of it too is that it, oh, I'm in a really art, large R1, yeah. and we have such a wide range of oh, faculty yeah. <laughs> and of faculty enthusiasm for different approaches that we kind of have to support all of them. Yeah, I, I am kind of hopeful that um, we see some people. Uh, as they're taking their pause, because I also think probably we're going to see people want to take a little pause after this. I hope that as some folks are taking their pause, they also think about how to restructure the actual curriculum goals so that, because I think a lot of people realize there's way too much in my class, right? Like, <laughs> you can't do this online. It's like, well, guess what? You couldn't do it in person either. You, you know, <laughs> Uh, if you thought that students could keep up with this in person, you know, that was just because you were going through a rapid fire in lectures. Um, but it was still too much, you know. And so I kind of hope that there's, during that pause where people catch their breaths, there's some thought about intentionally making some changes to the curriculum that can then be, you know, implemented in another year. Because that, 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 that work does take time and it's, it's careful work and it's thoughtful work. But it, it also gives people a chance to take a pause, right? So I kind of hope that slide, that's my, you know, in a perfect world, that slides itself into the year of pause. But. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that made me think about, Maria, was um, at UF, we've got a, a task force that recently kicked off in equity and assessment. And it's they've just started their work. I'm going to be a part of that group. But I'm really excited, too, to see what comes out of that, because there are, it's, it's faculty-led, it's faculty-driven. Um, I'm there representing IT as a support. Um, so how can we bring in technologies to support these outcomes? But there are folks who are really interested, I think, in doing something a little bit more transformational, a little bit more revolutionary than returning to the status quo, which I see in the chat some folks are, are concerned about too. And I, I think we're gonna have folks at every part of that spectrum. Yeah, agreed. Thank you, Maria. That's a great question. Shannon, I love just tracing your thinking as you moved across this, bring up the different issues from um, the task force to the size and, and challenges of being an R1. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And if you're new to the forum, by the way, that's a great example of a video question. It's, it's just really that easy to do. Uh, let me give you an example of a text question now from last one of last week's guests. Oh, this is great. This is from Professor Beth Benedicts at DePaul who asks, what are your strategies and personal experiences using IT to enhance project-based learning? What has worked best for you? <laughs> so I'm going to give you a kind of a cheating answer, right? Um, and it's to work closely with the faculty because one strategy isn't going to work well across classrooms, across outcomes. You have the same class 
taught online, the same class taught blended or hybrid, the same class taught face-to-face, -face, you're gonna use different strategies and different outcomes, and then what faculty are willing to do, right? So um, in making the jump to an online delivery in spring of 2020, I would have loved to have seen more transition at, at UF um, than we saw at, uh, at some other institutions in terms of tackling authentic assessment instead of exams. Um, but that's what a lot of folks did. So as an instructional designer, and my background here is in instructional design, I would work with the faculty to define their specific learning outcomes and talk with them about what they're prepared to assess. Uh, because doing authentic learning, one of the reasons that I've found that faculty are, are resistant is that it does often take a lot of time and dedication to evaluate, um, to provide meaningful feedback to students and help them understand where they've been successful in illustrating their learning and where they've been um, maybe less successful and have some opportunities for growth. Um, Brian, I really want to learn who this is. <laughs> This, this is one of our cats. This is um, this is Ash. She's um, she's a shameless photo bomber who, whenever the whenever the video light comes on, she climbs up me just just automatically. So so we now have that Ghostbusters moment. We have cats and dogs living together. Hello, Ash. Um, so I, I know that was a little bit of a of a cheat with my answer, uh, and so I will say that one of the things that we rely on for sure is collaborative learning. Um, in the LMS, we have a lot of cloud products that we use. Um, obviously, it depends on the discipline as well. Um, it's not always necessarily an IT solution, but it might be an IT way to share the outcome of the project. So my background is in archaeology, and um, one of the that I was very happy to help uh, an archaeology instructor with was creating a digital curation um, in, a, in a team. So that wasn't an IT solution necessarily. It was just which IT solution helped them meet their specific outcome. They were still working very much with their hands. They're still very much working in the, the physical world. It was how they just represented that um, within their team to each other. I so no, go ahead, Brian, that's it. I teach uh, a lot on gaming and design for education. And so students will make a game or a modified game and either they'll do it digitally or they'll do a a paper and, and, and a cardboard, and, and the, the key thing is the learning. And, 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 oh, that's a great question, and, and again, thank you, Shannon, for, for walking us through an answer. Not so much of a cheat. I, I think this is a very good strategic, strategic response. Um, so, if you're, again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a text question, so you can just type that in. Let me give you another video question. We have Victor Vallejas. Victor, if I mangled your name, I'm sorry, from Oregon State, um, and we bring him up on stage. Victor, how'd I do? Uh, close. It's Viegas. Double L's kind of like a Y sound. <laughs> thank you. Thank but, but thanks for bringing him up. And uh, thank cool. you, Shannon. Uh, congratulations on the award. Thank you. It's awesome. Uh, I like to hear about the diversity inclusion. Um, I'm a champion for that uh, here at Oregon State. Uh, and my question is uh, not necessarily just in your university, uh, but uh, have you seen any trends? People talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but to me, uh, that means different things to different people, right? And for me, it's representation. So as our demographics, especially on the West, are, are increasingly Latino, Hispanic, do you see people putting um, actions, you know, other than just saying, hey, we, we believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but are they actually hiring folks to um, increase the percentages so that they're reflecting and representing the demographics that we're trying to reach. You know, personally, I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, I'm the only Latino Hispanic bilingual in our uh, division. And uh, when someone needs help with Spanish, you know, they point to me. <laughs> so <laughs> it falls to me to, to do a lot of bit of that. There's also international students. So I'm not talking just Latino Hispanics, but you know, students having other folks that uh, speak their language, uh, or at least uh, are familiar with their experience, you know, I think is very important. So just wondering, I, every time I come onto these things, I look at all these pictures and things and it's, it's sorry, it's so white, <laughs> you know, and it's not necessarily a skin thing. It's more of a cultural thing. I, I realize that, but have you seen any inroads in that? 
That's a tough question. <laughs> Thanks, Victor. Um, I, I hope so. Uh, I don't. I don't have insider visibility into you know h higher ed challenges or the hiring patterns outside of like you know Coupa HR reports and and things like that. Um, I I hope that we're making a difference. I definitely see like you shared where it's meaningful and where it matters. One of the things that um, locally at our institution started occurring a couple of years ago um, at some of our internal conferences, uh, Tim Brophy, who's our director of institutional assessment, started including a student panel. And students would talk about the impact of assessment and their curricula and their programs on them and their lives. And um, one panel, a um, uh, a young black man who was, uh, I think it was a fourth year engineering student said, in my entire time here, I've never had a faculty member who looked like me. And there were times he shared that that, that made him feel less confident uh, about what he could achieve. And I think that was the strong, by far the strongest takeaway from the entire conference. Um, and I can say locally that, yeah, I mean, we, UF has definitely made some inroads in, in hiring more folks who look different. Like you said, not all um, not all diversity is about what's apparent, but racial diversity is absolutely essential uh, in making sure that we've got different voices represented. I definitely hope that we start to see some changes and it's prevalent across, across higher ed in a lot of ways, right? So I mentioned that my background's in archeology span um, specifically, I was very active in the Society for Historical Archaeology, and for a decade, we wrestled with the fact that we didn't have many Black colleagues, we didn't have many Black students. Why was that? Um, in part, I think a lot of times folks might be smarter than to go into that field, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it takes a lot of privilege to go into a field where you know you may not be compensated very well, or you know that you can always find another career option. It takes a lot of privilege to go, go into a career like that. Um, and so I think a lot of disciplines are in the same place from talking to colleagues. It sounds like a lot of disciplines are starting to understand that their structures are built on privilege. Uh, and a lot of that is baked into academia and that has definitely steeped over to the staff side. Um, I think that I see it changing a little more rapidly on the staff side, but that's anecdotal. Um, and I think some disciplines are doing a better job than others. But I don't, I don't know for sure. I know the only thing I know for sure is we've got a long way to go. Thank you, thank you both for the, for the very serious question. Uh, and and about the forum, this is something we've been recruiting more and more uh, from uh, BIPOC populations. Um, both for our guests and, of course, uh, for, uh, for our participants. Uh, we have more work to do and we keep doing that work. So I'm grateful for you to end it. Uh, we have more questions that are coming in. And thank you, Shannon, for, uh, for answering this one. Uh, let's bring up one from Stephen Ehrman, uh, who's author of a new book. And he has a question specifically about the word revolution. Use the word revolutionary. What kind of revolution would you like to be a part of? What factors might help some version like revolution happen? What factors make the revolution unlikely? <laughs> I would love to see okay. higher ed. Thank you for leaving that up, <laughs> Brian. That's helpful. Um, Multi-part question. I would love to actually dig into and evaluate what parts of higher ed are successful. What parts of higher education are serving our students. Um, I read a, an Ed Surge article recently about um, Amazon's likely approach toward K-12 education, and certainly that's going to impact higher ed. And I admit that going into it, my, um, my, my gut reaction was, this is terrible. I want absolutely nothing to do with the capitalization, the corporatization of, of education some of the outcomes they described in the article, I would be attracted to. Um, so I, I don't have children, but some of the models of education were actually attractive to me. So I have to, I think, get over my own of what 
might be possible. Um, in terms of revolutionary, I, I'm hoping, so I mentioned the, the task force on equity for assessment at our institution. I'm really hoping that we can talk more faculty into really evaluating how they assess learning and what learning means. From for many faculty, that will be nothing short of revolutionary, right? Because there's a lot of faculty who have been through um, traditional higher ed systems, which were established by cisgendered hetero white men. Um, these are still the structures that we very much replicate and reify every day. Um, it would be in some ways revolutionary to reapproach what assessment means even in a single program at an R1 public institution. That's not to say that it hasn't been done. Uh, it's not to say that we wouldn't be borrowing from some of our colleagues in different places. Uh, my husband teaches at a local formerly community college, now college with a with a new um, BA program. He teaches in welding, so he teaches in a competency-based program. Yeah. But there are a lot of ways that I think we could borrow from that model. Do I think it's likely to happen short term? No. Could it be revolutionary? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. My hat's off here. Uh, that's great stuff. Uh, so was that question. Thank you, Steve. We have more questions coming in, and I want to test that in the future here to share one of them. This is uh, this comes from uh, Paul Walsh on Twitter, and let's just see if I can share this for all of you can see it. There we go. There we go. Uh, Paul asks, how will you leverage campus leadership seeing designers? Whoop, I gotta bring that back up. Uh, there we go. Let me make sure that's back up so I can speak for a minute. Um, how will you leverage campus leadership seeing designers and supporting faculty is more important? And I imagine this will be a brief window of opportunity. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I I don't know specifically, Paul. One of my concerns is actually how to protect my staff. Um, and so we've got we've got some instructional support, instructional designers centrally. We've got distributed instructional designers. So some of our better endowed colleges also have strong teams. Um, I don't have over over what happens within their team. So my, my sphere of influence is very much in the in the central unit in terms of instructional design faculty support. I think short term, um, I am very concerned about making sure that they feel supported even to do things like take vacation, right? Um, I think what you're asking is more about how to make sure that people value their input in ways that maybe they didn't before. Um, if anything, I think what I've seen recently is faculty articulating that value. And that's oftentimes where the gap previously existed. So, you know, at my institution, we're not tenured, we're not tenure accrued, we're not tenure track. Um, but getting the faculty's appreciation for our roles and our background and our education and our expertise I see that shifting a lot. Um, I, and it started, I will say, pre-pandemic. Uh, I think in the pandemic, we've been able to kind of capitalize on that shift and that change. We've been able to work with more folks and help them understand that our roles exist to support them. They're the experts in their discipline, but we have expertise in, in pedagogy um, and applying technologies. So in terms of campus leadership, this isn't always true, but campus leadership often listens to faculty. And oftentimes at our institution, campus leadership is made up of, of people who were in that position who were in faculty lines. Mm -hmm. And so I've also seen that starting to shift as we see people moving into campus leadership positions from faculty positions. If they've worked with instructional designers, educational developers, then they have already an understanding of where that support can contribute. Um, and I'm starting to see that shift too. So, so we were reached out um, to recently by an associate dean who wants us to help with, um, we're a land grant institution and we have a lot of, of faculty in our extension offices and their main focus 
is sometimes supporting local communities, the, the agricultural community, and programs like 4-H. We would never have heard from them previously, and now we're being tapped to help support their instructional efforts. Now, that's not maybe the, the focus of our funding, um, and it's not where we'll put the focus of our main efforts, but to be able to help with that, just to be asked, I think shows a shift that's starting to happen. Thank you for uh, for meditating on that on that question so well, and, and thank you for the question. We have more questions coming in, friends, and for those who've uh, joined us uh, recently, again, we have uh, Shannon Dunn here from the University of Florida, uh, and we have a ton of people who want to ask more. And one uh, comes from Eric Mystery, who's actually thinking about the uh, faculty again. Um, how do you encourage your faculty to come learn with you? One of the biggest challenges is for us folks don't know what they don't know, and time, energy, or such a limited resource. Yeah, so this is, this continues to be a challenge no matter what, right? Because faculty, hopefully they stay with you for a while, uh, but for a huge variety of reasons, faculty move on just like staff move on. Um, we partner with our Center for Teaching Excellence. Our Center for Teaching Excellence is under the provost. They've started doing some learning communities and invited us to participate. So that's really nice. We get to create relationships there. Um, another strategy that we've taken on is just outreach. So we ask for 10 minutes at a faculty meeting once a year and we go and we do our spiel. And sometimes the faculty who were sitting in the room the year before forgot that we existed. And so it's just nice to have that opportunity to have that reminder to go through the huge range of services that we offer. Um, now, we do get folks who aren't necessarily looking to learn and grow. Um, they're looking for folks to maybe do some data entry work, um, put their quizzes into Canvas. We just try to take people where they are. Um, I know that's, I said that earlier, but um, we try to help people understand what we can do for them, what kind of supports we can provide. Uh, very much that's the case with accessibility. So we don't have um, a dedicated team of staff to help with, say, PDF for mediation and, and other things like that. We do have captioners on staff, but we try to help faculty take ownership for the accessibility of their course materials. For someone who's never developed any kind of digital course content before, that can be hugely overwhelming if you go through everything at once. So sometimes we take a stepwise approach, right? And so just the first time we work with them, we might broach um, document structure and headings and how important that is. And then we might talk about some of the challenges of exporting to PDF and why you might wanna just use native file contents instead. Um, we talk about for folks who want to do some graphic design, we talk about um, color contrast and why that might be important. So a lot of it is, again, just meeting faculty where they are. Some faculty are really excited to come in and have us do an evaluation of their course and um, hear our recommendations and and some faculty aren't. So it's it's taking them honestly where they are and, and trying to bring them along with us. It's a very good uh, pedagogical if I if I if I if I Terry Brandon a question about that, but I think Terry Terry asked accessibility issues as a pandemic highlight for online teaching. Can you repeat that, Brian? Just kind of just a little bit for me. Yeah, which accessibility issues has the pandemic highlight? <laughs> Can I answer which accessibility issues has it not highlighted? <laughs> yeah, um. I mean, it's it, it's it's everything, right? I mean, we had so many folks who didn't. We had so many folks who'd never worked in Canvas before, uh, so helping them with something as simple as a template that already had some some page structure built in because they didn't know what headings were. Um, definitely documents. Um, so we we do use Canvas and we use Ally, and that's really helpful because the faculty, um, once we coach them to access it, they can see their accessibility score and get kind of moved through some coaching on how to make their course a little bit more accessible, at least the digital components. Um, captioning is huge. Yeah. Auto caption. I 
think you just froze up. Um, here, Shannon, let me make sure. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, reload uh, Shannon's site. Just um, moderately quick fixes. Uh, they're things that really get down into the design of courses themselves. So I don't know. I think I think while it can be painful to acknowledge where we are and acknowledge all the problems that the pandemic highlighted, in some ways it's really it's really good because we can't move forward unless we acknowledge what we need to work on. Uh, we just had a little stutter for a few seconds. You froze up. Um, so uh, okay, just I was about to relaunch you on, on the screen, but I think you're okay. Okay. Uh, that may just be a maybe a buffering issue, but that's that's a very very good answer. Um, well, let's um let's bring it. We have so many questions coming in now. We uh, bring uh, one of our uh, favorite guests, favorite participants, uh, one of our long term uh, supporters, and just a general awesome thinker uh, with a new book out. Uh, this is Tom Ames. So let me bring him up on stage. Hello, Tom. Hello. Oh, I get to be the giant. You're I get to be the giant head. Yeah, <laughs> you're wearing a black shirt now. You're ruining the whole background. I was hoping for more blue, but now uh, what is uh, the blue shirt's in the laundry? Oh man, oh, <laughs> my expectations are shattered. You, um, you had a question. Yeah, so you know, one of my things uh, is always about how much technology drives what we do versus us what we want to do driving technology. And one of the things that I have been working a lot with faculty on my own, uh, you know, we've kind of had this informal faculty support network. Uh, I used to do this formally. I'd, I'm just a regular faculty person right now. Um, but uh, I've had to uh, shovel with the best of them when, when it comes to COVID. But one of the things that uh, keeps uh, kept coming up as conversation, and you mentioned it earlier, is this question of assessment. And I was kind of wondering, and as far as your own experience at Florida was concerned, uh, to what extent did remote learning force people to take a hard look at what they were doing in assessment and, and, and make creative use of technology in order to accomplish that uh, versus, and, and how much of that do you think is sustainable uh, versus those people who wanted to keep doing what they were doing and just layering on handcuffs to make sure that no one cheated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's an awesome question, Tom. Um, I think there's a mix of both. I think that we, because we're in support, wound up hearing a lot from the latter folks who really wanted to understand how to use proctoring software, which is, um, you know, I think inherently problematic. Uh, I think too. I want to. I want to give faculty some credit because asking them to make major changes, even though it's what I would like to see during a pandemic, um, when a lot of them are learning new technologies, they're learning uh, a course management, they're learning management system they've never used before. Um, they have challenges in their personal lives. They're trying to learn how to use Zoom. Maybe they've used it as a participant, but they've never set up their own meetings it's a lot it's a lot of cognitive load for them um that on top of just the stress of of not knowing necessarily what's going to happen in six weeks or a month or even two weeks right so um we did we did see a mix uh i do i think that the general approach here is you know syllabus is contract and once you've gone into a semester and the students understand what's going to be expected of them they have some justifiable um, expectations that that's those are the assessments that they should expect, um, and that's that's what I mostly saw as the approach. Now that said, I do think people made adjustments to their assessments where they could. A lot of times, at our institution, the flexibility that was provided was um, given to the deans um, to make the decision about, and so that varied a lot across the institution. Um, I definitely hope that this has given faculty reason to think creatively um, because honestly, as much as onerous as creating an authentic assignment and thinking about how to grade it might be for some faculty, it's no more onerous than setting up proctoring software, 
right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not like that and, doesn't take any time. And, and, and it gives you a much better sense of, of what the students can do than some artificial environment that's created in a test. Um, but um, yeah, I know that, I mean, you know, one of the things that I typically, I remember early on, I had one teacher, she was teaching um, English as a, as a foreign language. And she was saying, I have no idea how to do these little quizzes that I do where I ask the students to read something and then they have to explain it, you know, and then they have to decode it using the quiz. I'm like, well, just have them pull out a phone and record a video of them explaining what they read. I mean, you'll get a much better sense. Plus, they get the verbal on top of the reading. And I don't, you know, she, and it was like a light bulb went off in her head. And I'm like, this isn't that hard. I mean, seriously. Uh, it's just a question of stepping back and saying, okay, just because this is the way it's always been done doesn't necessarily mean it's better or even easier. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. But I've I, seen my kids' teachers with Proctorio and stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, my kids are in high school. Uh, and, and, and watching that go, you know, it's just been, I've, I've just been scratching my head. One teacher was giving proctorio exams in the classroom because she wanted to give them the same way with the, in the classroom as she did on online and they have like a mixed thing, right? Where the, it's supposedly hybrid or whatever it's called. Half of them are online and half are in person. And of course the problem with Proctorio is it, 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 it goes off if there's motion in the background. Well, in a room full of people, somebody's gonna move. <laughs> you know? And she gave it up because she was like, I can't make this work, so. <laughs> yeah. and I think, Tom, I think there's a kernel in what you shared, if I can pick up on that, um, which Eight. is that when for us, right, so we work in technology all the time and, and helping people make that transition and figure out how to best use technology to meet their needs is, is really fun and exciting for us. And sometimes when the um, answer seems so simple to us, we think like, like you did, like, just do this, right? But faculty sometimes are so, and this is what I meant earlier, there's sometimes, not always, so tech shy or so tech averse, or they just don't have the confidence to try something that maybe won't work. Or maybe they thought, okay, I can have a student record on their phone or on their machine, but then what do they do with it? So I'm speaking about. Okay, well, that's the second time um, here. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to quickly pause you, Shannon, and bring you back up. Hang on one second. Let's just, uh, let's just do this. Brian is so evil. He just pauses people and brings them back up again. He's like a god. If only I could do that in real life. That would be the real thing. <laughs> okay, Shannon, are you there? Uh oh. Okay. It didn't work that time. Uh, Try the crank. Uh, Shannon, it looks uh, it looks like you're having a problem um, with uh, bandwidth on your side. Um, so here, uh, I'm going to ask you to relaunch the page. Um, and uh, and to do that, uh, Tom, thank you. Uh, let me uh, let me bring you down to clear some room and see if we can bring um, uh, Shannon right back. Hang on, friends. Uh, let's see if we can uh, if we can repeat this and get uh, Shannon back on stage. Well, oh, it looks like you're still frozen, Shannon. Uh, so. Here, let me see if we can get this uh, right back. Hang on, friends. Uh, as we uh, uh, cope with bandwidth, this may be an issue at the uh, University of Florida, or it may be something that has uh, just come up uh, in the uh, in the bandwidth area itself. Let's see. Yeah, I think Shen has to reload the page. Well, while we're doing this, uh, I just want to point out that we have a, a whole stack of questions uh, that have come in from some great people, uh, and they write uh, they range from technology from Kate Borowski to questions about diversity from George Station uh, to questions of planning from Nick Santini, and uh, of some very interesting questions about uh, services from uh, Bob Erdischek and from Jessica Sullivan. So let's see if we can get Shannon back out now. There you are. Well, that's embarrassing. Not at all, not at all. I mean, one of the things 2020 taught us is that uh, everyone is, I think, very comfortable with technology, um, woes and stutters of all kinds. Um, the key thing is you're okay and, and you're with us. That's the most important thing. Um, 
no problem. You, you were you were answering Tom very very nicely. Thank you for that. Can you hear me okay? I can. Yes. Very good. Very good. Well, in in each the time, and now that we got you back, uh, let me just um, uh, bring up one of the technology questions because this changes around a little bit. But I think this is a really really interesting deep question. This is from, from uh, Kate Borowski, uh at Southwestern uh, Minnesota State University, who asks. With COVID, our use of low-end VR is reached to a halt because of equipment. Google seems to recognize access as an issue because they're ending expeditions and what's going to happen with VR in education? So I really wish that I had my educational technologist with me here uh, to help answer this question. We are centrally only starting to explore VR uh, as a service that, that we help people explore. Um, in terms of folks on our campus who are doing, you know, they're a little bit further ahead of us. Um, we've got some, some really exciting things. Um, Digital Worlds Institute, Media Effects Technology Lab. Um, these folks are, are using VR really intentionally in their curriculum. Um, we, I don't know if I'm going to give you a great answer. We just aren't, we aren't there yet. Um, I haven't been as engaged in that space. Uh, one of the things that that we're trying to do is is act like the the hub in that wheel. So we're trying to connect the folks who are doing all of that work. Um, I definitely think that in terms of what we're going to approach, in part because we are one of those central support units, we're looking at ways that we can help distance students as well as um, our campus students engage in those spaces. Um, so if someone can't afford a VR headset and they can't get to one of our libraries to check one out, what options do they have? Can we make sure that we're helping faculty select and provide experiences that also access from their machine, whatever type of machine that is? Uh, so that doesn't speak specifically to the technologies you were asking about, um, but it's kind of where, where we are with VR centrally. That, that's, that's, that's a good answer. Hey, thank you for question. I should put this guy by not just one technology, uh, but also the, uh, um, how we use it and the question of equity. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have more questions coming in, and we're down to about 12 minutes, so I want to make sure that we get some of the uh, major highlights. We've got one coming from Cal State uh, from the Splendid George Station, who asks Beyond hiring, which he puts down as a visual university, how do you encourage staff, and by extension, the faculty? to engage with their whole selves at work so that policy and campus culture can evolve up to the good. That's a great uh, we'll put that back up again. That's a great yeah, question. that's a really great, great question. I think this probably has to, to vary by service um, and by team and even by team culture. Um, but I will say, I think one of the things that, that I love about our team, and I, I hope that people feel they're bringing their whole selves in this way is that um, we tend to hire folks from a broad variety of backgrounds. Uh, so I, um, I thought I was going to pursue an academic track. There are a couple of folks on the team who, who are in similar positions, but we've also got folks who uh, worked in other places in higher ed, worked in libraries, worked at help desks. We have about half of our staff who came from K-12. And it's really important to me that they also share their backgrounds and experiences um, in some of the decisions that we're making. Um, we know that a lot of times people in, who, who've worked in K-12, particularly as educators, get more specific educational focused education than the folks who are delivering education at some of our institutions. Um, and that's just how our system is created. In terms of people bringing their whole selves more generally, um, again, I, I think that I think that's a tricky line to walk. Um, there are some things I don't want to know about my staff, <laughs> um, but I do think that dealing with the pandemic too has helped us appreciate you know the complexity of people's lives. So. Um, because I don't have children, I don't often think to ask people about their children immediately. It's just not something, it's a, it's a, it's a bias that I have. 
um, I think more quickly to ask people about their animals than about their children. It's just more front of mind for me. But making sure that we're providing the flexibility for staff to be successful um, and be parents and to do all of the things that they need to do or, or caregivers of any kind um, and to do all the things they need to do to provide that care and still not feel like they're letting anybody down on the job, work the hours that they want to or need to work. Um, I think we've had to explore that a lot more. Um, I think also making sure that people feel comfortable creating space to get to know one another um, in a remote environment that feels strange. It feels like maybe you're cheating or you're not working if you do something social. Uh, but in order to help people get to know one another, my team had that a little bit easier. We'd worked together, most of us, for quite a few years before we went, before we went remote. Um, but we had a couple of new folks with us who I wanted to make sure felt really seen and prepared and supported. Um, and that's been, it's been a challenge. I want them to, to feel like they're supported um, and that their whole self is welcomed. Um, some of that too, some folks don't want to share some things and that's also okay. Some people feel more comfortable being more private in, in their work environment. Um, and that's kind of the flip side. So how to make sure that, that they also don't feel pressured to share or express things that they might not feel comfortable doing. George Station has a, a, an excellent habit of asking very, very deep questions. Um, and the answers have to ramify because they were back to me. Um, thank you, George and, and Shannon. Thank you for that uh, glimpse into your staff. And the Frank, the description of your uh, management, that's really, really helpful. Um, this is the end of the hour, and we'd like to make sure we touch the future of looking at home. And some of the questions went right to that. So let me bring up uh, a question from uh, Nicholas Santilli from Scott. And he asked, well, one of the things I'd like to hear is what strategic decisions the University of Florida is making to prepare for the future, given what the institutions have experienced to through the pandemic. Yeah, so Nicholas, I am a frontline manager. So I would love to be able to tell you about the strategic decisions that are occurring on a high level. I am not in a position to do that. Uh, that said, I did have the opportunity to participate in the creation of our strategic plan for IT. Um, I know that one of our major areas of focus is supporting student success in a way that is even beyond what we've tried to accomplish before. Um, so I would say one of the ways that I know that IT is focused on helping with that work is any way that we can support student affairs with some of the equity gaps that were highlighted in the pandemic. Um, one of the things that was really I think within our, our town gown relationship um, were some of the IT possibilities that we could provide um, additional support services to the local community in some ways. Um, that's uh, that's all that's all big picture. And again, I, as a as a frontline manager, that's that's as much as I can probably can commit to in terms of the institution. Um, locally, we, we are trying to reach out to some of the folks, and I, I hinted on this at the beginning too, um, some of the folks who we don't normally hear from. So we want to make sure that we're providing the services that they need to be successful. Um, that's something that we were not doing. Um, we were providing the services that we knew were in demand, but they were being used by the same folks to the same ends. That's it. That's it. But this is this is a good answer. I think uh, Nick is uh, uh, is teasing uh, a direction of your future as you continue to stand up the hierarchy of the University of Florida. Uh, and it's a really good question. Uh, so it's really vital to keep in mind. We have another future-oriented question that comes uh, uh, from Jessica Sullivan at uh, NYU, uh, and she asks regarding the suite of services we offer. What are your new initiatives and current goals? And what services are most used by faculty and 
have you developed any features or services with faculty input? Man, people just want to know everything about you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Brian, can you leave that question up for me? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so it was currently, well, pre-pandemic, we offered traditional instructional design, fairly white glove service, and I, an instructional designer might have anywhere between five and 10 faculty they were working with, um, and some workshops, some online workshops mostly. The workshops we've continued, the instructional design kind of white glove, high touch service we had to pause on with the pandemic so that we could pivot um, the word that everybody loves so much and provide all kinds of other support. We supported our help desk, our e-learning support team. We took tickets from classroom support. Um, so we've been focused on helping faculty as well as our colleagues. Our, our instructional design support was designed early on um, with input from faculty. We're looking at ways, and I, I hinted that at this with the answer to my last question, um, to get more input specifically from faculty and in ways that I hope are very like bite-sized. Um, I don't wanna ask a lot of faculty. I don't wanna ask them to come to a focus group and spend hours with us. I don't want them to feel like it's a burden to provide this. I just wanna know for them, and we're gonna reach out specifically to early career women um, and, and um, BIPOC faculty to ask them, what do you need? What could we do to support you in helping meet your instructional and educational goals? Um, we're hoping to, to turn that into some kind of influence on our services. So the future of our services after the pandemic, I think is very much in, in the air. Um, I really wanna hear from faculty what they would find most beneficial. Um, I suspect that a lot of people will still really want the white glove high touch service. It's an extraordinary benefit for folks who've never built an online or blended class before. Uh, we take on a lot, of, a lot of the work and we do make a lot of recommendations that um, we're told are helpful um, in people delivering, instructors delivering those courses. Um, the faculty workshops are really something that I think will continue. Uh, we reach a lot of people once they're built they're relatively easy to maintain. Um, they continue with a, an institution of the size, they continue to have really great enrollment. Um, we wanna focus more on UDL and accessibility and making sure that we're providing just-in-time resources so that faculty can access those whenever they want. I think just-in-time resources in general, are, it's probably gonna be a theme for us um, across the IT organization and not just within instructional design, but in instructional design as well. That's very ambitious. And, and for those who don't recognize the acronym, UDL is Universal Design for Credit. Yes. Uh, very, very good practice. Thank you for that excellent question. Um, now, I, I have, a, since we're last minute of the program, uh, I have the privilege of the moderator and ask one question for myself, which is, uh, how can we keep up with you as you as you race forward to all these services and all, the, all these expansions? and all these ambitions, what's the best way to follow Shannon Dunn in the future? <laughs> to follow me. Uh, so I do have Twitter. I'm not very, I'm learning. I am open to learning from experts, particularly on the call recommendations. Um, I think that I am Shannon underscore M underscore Dunn. <laughs> I am also on LinkedIn there too. I'm very open and, and willing and happy to learn from experts who are great at engaging in those spaces. These are two things, social media is not my strong place and I would love to learn from folks. Um, that's how you can find me and where you can find me and send me all, all the recommendations, all the pointers. I will take them. Well, that's very good. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'll put that up for everyone to see. There you go, we should be able to see this now. Channel underscore M underscore done. Um, and I'm sure all kinds of Twitter themes would be happy to, uh, to, to at you and to, to share all kinds of thoughts. Um, this is, uh, and you already shared a really nice thing about the course mapping. It's now our games. It's very good. Um, so, um, I'm trying. We, we are at the, at the end of the hour, and we have so many questions for each other. We could just go on for another hour easily. Um, it's been so great to hear from you. Um, this is you know, already someone who is way, way beyond your years in terms of thinking, analysis, and plans. It's absolutely delightful for you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. And, and y'all tweet me the questions and I'll answer them. 
Uh, we will. Um, in fact, uh, there, there were uh, a bunch of people who wanted to follow up, so um, you know, we should be able to do that um, uh, via Twitter. Um, but no, and, and we're going to have to circle back with you uh, to see what happens when they rename Florida Shannon Dunlap. <laughs> It would definitely, definitely happen. Um, so thank you. Thank you again so much. And uh, please, please take care and be safe. But don't leave anybody yet. Uh, let me just uh, I'll mention a couple of notes at closing. Remember that next week is our fifth year anniversary program. So you've got to be there and uh, be ready to be silly and ambitious and playful and visionary at the same time. And coming up after that, we have sessions on equity, on e-learning, on reinventing a public university. If you go to tinyurl.com slash forum2021, you can find out more of that. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about all this stuff, about how to lead a research university, how to deal with equity, how to deal with the digital divide, we have all kinds of venues for this in social media, including Twitter, of course. Uh, if you'd like to go back into the past and look at some of our previous sessions, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, where you can find more than 240 sessions, all available for your perusal. And of course, in the meantime, for the next week or so, please thank you. First of all, thank you for all of your questions today and all of your comments, which are really, really thoughtful. In the meantime, take care. Work hard on, on, on this current semester. Stay safe, above all. And we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>